Welcome to Law Pack's converse, special conversation tonight with uh, uh, Council Member Mike Bonin. And this conversation tonight is going to be led by Law Pack's uh, political involvement chair, Jasmine Canning. But I just want to give you a little bit, just 60 seconds of Law Pack. Um, we are a 30-year-old um, organization formed here in Los Angeles and the oldest African-American women PAC in Los Angeles and in the state of California. There's other organizations that are doing the same, but we started as a PAC specifically for African-American women. And um, that's how we started. And our sentiments remain the same. We're not only for African-American women, but we support candidates and ballot measures that look after the African-American woman. So, um, Tonight, it's only going to be an hour, so I don't want to belabor it because there's so many places we could be and um, there's dinner on the stove for many and there are meetings to follow. So I'm without further ado, I'm going to turn this conversation over to again our um, political action chair, um, Jasmine Canick, and again, um, as I welcomed him before, um, our council member Bonin, I want to say thank you for being here with us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. Um, I am, let me see, let's see if I can, I'm not the Zoom queen. <laughs> All right. So, okay, there we go. Hey, council member. Okay, so I had a whole script here and then Ingrid came in and kind of stole my thunder. So I'm, I'm gonna try to work around it and get through it. So welcome everyone. My name is Jasmine Canick and I am the political vice president for Law PAC. Law PAC stands for the Los Angeles African American Women Political Action Committee. Law PAC is celebrating its 30th anniversary in 2021. You're going to be hearing a lot about that. Uh, we were the first, as Ingrid said, the first political action committee, first PAC in California to focus on the issues important to Black women. Today, under the leadership of our president, who you just heard from, Ms. Ingrid Palmer, and our executive board, Law PAC is a leading political action committee in California for the identification and support of progressive candidates, ballot initiatives, and political issues leading to positive socioeconomic and political change for the Black community through the power of people and money. Because if you know anything about politics and getting people into office, it takes more than just votes, it takes money too. And that's what we do. You can learn more about Law Pack by visiting lawpack.org, that's L-A-A-A-W-P-A-C.org, or by reaching out to any of our executive board members, many of whom are, I saw in the audience here. In addition to being a political action committee, Law PAC hosts a variety of forums aimed at not only educating voters on the issues, but bringing candidates and elected, elected officials to us, the community, for a deep dive conversation on those issues that are important to us. Tonight is no different. On behalf of the executive board of Law PAC, I am so pleased to welcome 11th District Council Member Mike Bonin for our candid conversation about our city's unhoused and housing crisis, which are two issues, mm -hmm. and they are both important, but they are both different. Um, if you have a question for the council member, drop it in the Q&A section. Um, if you want, you can include your name and the city or neighborhood you're from, and we're, I'm happy to read your question to the council member. Just put it in the Q&A section. Do not raise your hand. Put it in the Q&A section. I cannot say that enough. Put it in the Q&A section. All right. Mike Bonin represents Westside neighborhoods on the Los Angeles City Council. He took office in 2013 after a landslide victory in which he won every precinct in the sprawling 11th district, which included Pacific Palisades, Brentwood, West LA, Sautel, Mar Vista, Del Rey, Venice, Marina Del Rey, Playa Vista, Playa Del Rey, Westchester, and Ladera. As a council member, Mike has been a champion of neighborhoods, a force for smart, responsive government, and a progressive voice for social justice, which I can definitely attest to. His work has focused on building mass transit and reducing traffic, ending homelessness, protecting the environment, strengthening public safety, and fixing the city's broken development process to better serve residents and put neighborhoods first. 
Mike co-authored and won passage for the nation's first citywide $15 minimum wage, which was very important. And he was a key player in developing a comprehensive city county strategy on homelessness and in securing more than $130 million for homelessness programs. Mike was also a key player in shaping and securing voter approval of two landmark initiatives, which we know very well here at Law Pack, Measure M, which provided tens of billions of dollars to build a mass transit network in LA County and Proposition HHH, authorizing the city to issue $1.2 billion in bonds to build housing for people who are experiencing homelessness. In the neighborhoods Mike represents, he's known for his hands-on approach and his insistence on better, faster city services. He can be seen frequently filling potholes, sticking up trash, trimming the trees with city workers, or patrolling the streets with police officers or firefighters. As a part of his ambitious Access 11 plan to bring City Hall closer to our neighborhoods, and this is one of my favorite things that I love, Mike holds open community office hours in the evenings and on the weekends at local farmers markets, coffee shops, and other places to provide working families access to their council representative when it is more convenient for them. That is why I love him. Mike and his husband, Sean, live in Mar Vista with their young son. He's a member of Santa Monica's church, Santa Monica's church in Santa Monica. He's a Massachusetts native and a former newspaper reporter. Woo woo. Mike graduated from Harvard University with a BA in U.S. history. I know, I, you know, even when I'm introduced and people try to read my bio, I'm like, oh my God, I got to read my bio. But I, yeah. I picked out certain things from your bio, council member, because I need a more updated and a shorter bio. Is what I'm taking. It was, no, it it was great, and I picked out the things that I thought were going to be relevant for our conversation tonight that people may not have known about you. But thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, you are one of my favorite people because you. You don't put on fancy airs, you keep it real, you show up for work every day, you do the job. I mean, I, you know, you're just one of my favorite people. I, you, you're probably, you, you're definitely on my list of favorite people on the city council currently. You well, have thank a heart you. and a soul, and I appreciate that. Thank you, so. and, 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 mu and much <laughs> love back. I've said this online, I don't know that I've had an opportunity to say it to you face to face. Uh, just much love to you for all the incredible uh, work you did on the Ed Buck case. Uh, that verdict wouldn't have happened if you hadn't forced public uh, attention onto that. I appreciate it. And I definitely appreciate your support for folks who do not know Mike is very supportive to us over the past four years with this. And so I appreciate you for that, Mike. That so homelessness or um, our unhoused crisis, people experiencing homelessness. You know, the CDC just came out with this whole new guide on how we're supposed to, to refer to things, and I'm still learning. Um, but the bottom line is it all means the same thing. People who don't have a place to live permanently, yep. right? Yep. And for me personally, and I know for many of our members, that is the number one issue for, for us. Um, I recently participated um, as a political strategist in a poll for a citywide candidate that's running. And what was really interesting, but not surprising, was the number one issue for, for voters was, was our homeless crisis. So um, I wanted to have a conversation with you about that because we've seen you in the news a lot lately, taking a lot of heat, um, but not backing down <laughs> and standing firm. And we appreciate that. Um, and we've seen a lot of other things in the news too. We saw some things happening in Venice and we saw some things happening with our sheriff. And so I thought, let's talk to Mike about that. Let's, 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 have, a, let's, let's have a conversation about what's going on cool. um, in your district, but also not just in your district, but in our city and also yeah. in the hall. So let's just jump into it. Let's talk about Venice, what's going on in Venice. Um, I, have, I, I can tell you as somebody who goes to the beach every weekend, I stopped going to Venice. I, I go to Santa Monica Beach. Yep. And when I was going to Venice, they actually had tents on the sand. Yep. 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 Uh, uh, right next, to, they're literally tents on the sand. They did. And it, 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 was, it was very interesting. Yep. What's going on there now? Well, so based on that, I know that you have not been there in about a month. Uh, because there are not uh, tents uh, on the sand right now. Um, uh, we uh, housed during the month of uh, July and August, 
Uh, we brought indoors 211 people who are living on the boardwalk, thanks to the leadership of uh, Dr. Felicia Adams Kellum and St. Joseph Center and Lhasa. Um, uh, and are putting those 211 people on a path to permanent housing. Uh, and we did it, unlike the uh, Echo Park Lake model that we saw back in March, where they cleaned out uh, Echo Park Lake. Uh, we did it without uh, declaring martial law and having 750 police officers. I was just about to ask about that. You, you didn't have 750 police officers show up on the boardwalk? We, we, no? we didn't. We did this... No. Um, this was a multi-agency collaboration, and uh, we we decided to do it right. We had to give it time, we had to give it trust, and we had to give it transparency. And um, you know, it it was a few months of of, of outreach and of bringing folks indoors. Um, the key to it really was that people knew that we had in this case, this was an unusual program for the city, we had permanent housing resources for them. That means we had a, a long-term housing voucher. And while they were gonna go through that process, we would put them in a project room key or, or a motel in, in the meantime. Usually what the city has done is say to people, hey, we're gonna take you out of here. We'll put you in a motel for a few weeks and then let's all pray and wish really hard that we get you long-term housing. This one started with the longer term housing, which we're trying to find the units for people to match up with the vouchers. And that was a, a game changer because, you know, there's this myth in Los Angeles uh, that, that really, you know, social media, conservative talk radio, Tucker Carlson, you know, they all spread it, that people in Los Angeles are, 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 are criminals who are homeless by choice uh, mm. and they do not want to accept help that they're service resistant. And oh, and they're Nick, all drug addicts. Yep. Don't forget that they're all drug addicts who came from out of town. Yep. And th that's the narrative, right? And there was no place yeah. in LA, aside from perhaps Skid Row, where that narrative was more indelibly written than about Venice Beach. And, um, you know, I, I was even surprised, frankly, by how successful it was that when you offer people real housing and a real pathway, they, they want to accept it. You know, living outdoors is rough. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of trauma out there and people uh, were eager to accept it. Some folks, there were barriers. You know, some people needed to bring their pets. Some people wanted to be with their friends or loved ones. Some folks had a lot of belongings. Their artists down on the beach didn't want to give them up. So we had to sort of problem solve with each one. You know, what's the best way to get somebody in? And it, it, uh, it, it worked. And, you know, it, it, showed me that uh, something I knew intuitively, but it, I think it showed that um, in, in Los Angeles, there's this, this, there's this other false narrative. The other false narrative that's particularly strong in my part of town right now is you either have to choose the interests of people who are homeless or the interests of people who are housed, or you need to balance those two things. And that's false. Uh, everybody can win if you bring everybody in. And I think there's, there's sort of three doors that Los Angeles can choose to open on homelessness. One is the status quo, which is a nightmare. Status quo, everybody loses, housed and unhoused. Encampments are unsafe, unsanitary, they're unacceptable, it's inhumane. Nobody at all wins with the status quo. I agree. The, Door number two that, you know, there's some people running for mayor who come to my district and espouse this. Uh, there's uh, countywide elected officials like the sheriff who espouse this philosophy. They, they approach it from a outlaw homelessness approach, criminalize homelessness, push people mm -hmm. around and arrest them. And that doesn't work either. It is really, really expensive. It is phenomenally expensive. It doesn't work. It actually makes homelessness worse. And we keep getting sued and, and, the, and it makes the problem even more difficult. Uh, you cannot jail one, your way out of homelessness. Exactly. We learned that a long time ago. You cannot, exactly. We cannot use our jail yep. to hide people that we just simply don't want to see. Exactly. And, you know, at some point we're going to have to talk about the Olympics because I'm worried. I am worried about that too. 
I am very worried. worried about that too. Um, and uh, uh, because I've read some of the history of what happened in 1984 and of people and populations who got swept and how that began a process in LA of, of criminalizing young men of color. Uh, and we need to be very aware of that uh, and, and, and watchful of that. But that, that process of using criminalization as a strategy, not only does it not work, that actually does pit the interests of people who are unhoused versus people who are housed. That's when we're voting on these ordinances that say, no sitting here, no lying right. here. And that pits people against each other, which makes no sense because there is this door number three, which is housing people and providing services. It's less expensive than the status quo or criminalization. It works and everybody wins. Encampments go away, public space is restored, people's lives are restored, their lives are saved. And I mean, th th there is, there's this other narrative out there where uh, people are now saying homelessness isn't about housing. It's about mental health. It's about addiction. Uh, it's about unemployment. And we shouldn't be talking about housing. We should be talking about jobs. We should be talking about mental health. We should be talking about substance abuse recovery. We need to talk about all of those things. And we need to be providing all of those things. But if you get a job, and you don't have a place to live, you're still homeless. If you start taking meds for a mental illness and you don't have a place to live, you're still homeless. If you're trying to get sober and, the, and you don't have a roof over your head, you're still homeless. And it's a lot easier to keep a job. It's a lot easier to stay sober. And it's a lot easier to stay mentally and physically well if you have a roof over your head. And that has to be a, a, a common uh, 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 effort between the city, the county, the state, the feds, we all got to be pushing in that direction with all these services you need, but you got to get people indoors. So a couple of things. Um, I don't know what order to go in. Part of me wants to ask you first, have you spoken to your colleagues about your what worked in Venice to see if maybe that could be replicated uh, down here on Skid Row where I live by? Yes. Um, uh, you know, it was uh, something I had to get uh, some city funding for this. I had to get funding from the city to do this. You know, we had the, the long-term housing vouchers in place, but we needed money for that short-term for the interim. Mm -hmm. And so the city had to allocate some money from that. And there was some pushback on it, uh, but the mayor was very supportive. Uh, Mark Ridley Thomas was very supportive. Uh, and, and we got that money through. And since then, uh, uh, Mark Ridley Thomas in particular has really tried to elevate and lift this up, as has the mayor, of an example of, of how we can do things better in Los Angeles. Um, you know, the, the service agencies think it's great. And on the other hand, LAPD thought it was great because it, it wasn't a, a, a heavy lift for them. Their job was really to stand back uh, and not uh, uh, have to, you know, uh, uh, do, you know, a ton of arrests and enforcement. Well, was so, that because the sheriff was there that they were just standing no, there? No, well, let, let's get to the know. sheriff in just a second. I'll, I'll, I'll get to the sheriff in just a second. It was, uh, on, on this one, you know, it was a, a model that, that, that worked. And uh, Mark and Karen Price and I uh, put in a motion a few weeks ago uh, calling for us to use a bunch of unallocated homelessness money from the state and the feds and use it to replicate this program. Uh, it's called Housing Now. And the goal is using uh, housing vouchers, short-term rental subsidies, uh, stuff like that, quick things, not new brick and mortar, quick things to move 10,000 people off the streets uh, over the period of several months. And it, if we use the money wisely on quick and nimble stuff, um, uh, 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 master leasing units, motel conversions, we can do it. Would you agree that in the scheme of things, Venice is not as big a problem as, as Skid Row is in terms of our unhoused crisis? Because it, it, in the big scheme of things, uh, that's true. In the in the scheme of things, in my district, in your district, <laughs> that's yes. different. But um, I agree. You know, in your district. Yes, but, I but Skid Row is 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 absolutely much bigger. As Kevin DeLeon says 
there's more homeless people in his district alone than there are, I think, in, in every other major U.S. city except for uh, New York. Yes, he's my council member now. Um, I brought that up because when this happened in Venice, there was a lot of conversation going on in different circles wondering, well, why is Venice getting all this attention? Why, 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 why aren't people running down to, you know, uh, San Pedro on Fifth Street trying yeah. to pull folks off of the street? And there was a real conversation about whether or not it had to do with the constituents in your district mm -hmm. being who they are versus who the folks are on Skid Row. Um, and so that's why I asked, you know, what, you know, if you had passed any of your secrets on to your colleagues on how to get this done, um, because Skid Row is a mess. And, it, you know, I, because City Hall is just two blocks away from Skid Row, I know you know yep. that the majority of the inhabitants of Skid Row look like me. Yes, they do. Black. Yes, they do. And, you know, at Law Pack, being a group of Black women, you know, yep. we are deeply concerned about the struggle of Black people when it comes to housing in this city. Yep. And which is not to say that there were not unhoused people in Venice, because I saw them on the board oh, yeah. too. Yep. But not in the numbers that we see in other parts of the city. But we at one point felt like Venice was getting all the attention and all the, and maybe that some of that had to do with, you know, the sheriff and his antics too. Sure. But wow. yeah, I mean it had to do with a, a, a lot of different factors. I mean, Venice actually has a a a really serious homelessness crisis. Um uh it has one of the more dense uh populations of of homelessness. Uh, outside of Skid Row. Uh, you know, uh, lots of districts have a lot of homelessness. I've got, you know, we've housed 211 people or moved them indoors. We, we, we have still well over a thousand people just in that small area of Venice. So it is a, a dense population, but there was sort of a confluence of, of factors that worked. One is um, anything that happens in Venice gets international attention. Uh, so, you know, Nithya has done similar stuff. MRT has done similar stuff. KDL has done similar stuff. But CNN and BBC doesn't pay attention to stuff that isn't in sort of the international spotlight. So uh, we had more intense pressure because there was that spotlight. The, the other thing that pushed maybe a sense of urgency for Venice was um, it was a park. And as we were opening up our parks, uh, there was more pressure uh, uh, for public space. And you know, we had in May, the handball courts were closed because there were 20 people living in the handball courts. Um, you know, yes. the, the people couldn't play basketball. So, I mean, we had to find a way to let people after a year and a half come back and exercise and recreate. And so that added some urgency to it. Uh, but other people are doing very similar things uh, with, I mean, they, they earmark their resources for their district to, to try to do similar things. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, and still Skid Row does get the, the, the lion's share of the, the city's uh, resources. It's just, we've all got a bigger problem. And one of the things we've had historically in Los Angeles, which I try to fight, is this idea that everybody should be pushed into one area, the containment policies. And yeah. I'm committed, and one of the things I take some grief about is every part of the city has got to be part of the solution. Absolutely. I, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't grow up in LA per se, but my mom worked for LAPD. So I came downtown a lot. Oh. And I just remember um, only the homeless people were only on Skid Row back when I was growing up. Yep. Now you see people experiencing homeless everywhere every part of our city yep. every part of our county like there's nowhere you can go where you don't see it right nope. and so you mentioned parks um that's a great segue because one of our um one of our folks had a question about Western. westchester park yep I we hear a coming. lot about west yes it was yep. coming. <laughs> what is going on with westchester park i hear it is extremely i haven't been there recently uh, but i hear it's it's um it's stuff 
it's different these days. It, it is. Uh, Westchester Park has about uh, probably about 50 people, maybe a little bit less than that now, uh, living in it. Um, uh, encampments grew. They sprung up there during the pandemic, uh, as they did in many places. But that was a place where a lot of encampments uh, sprang up. Um, we uh, have done a sort of mini version of uh, what we did in Venice there. We've started to, where with um, the cooperation of Holly Mitchell, that's her supervisorial district there, Venice is Sheila Kuehl, Westchester is Holly. Uh, we managed to uh, uh, bring indoors uh, the people, I think it was about 15 or so, uh, who were uh, living closest to uh, the pool so we could reopen the pool. Uh, we have then done some rehousing to people who were living in the ball fields, which had to be repaired. So the ball fields are not mm. cleared off, are now cleared off and being repaired. And we got a lot of folks there housed, some in a hotel we purchased uh, near LAX, uh, near the LAX uh, uh, Crenshaw, soon to be transit stop, um, the former Motel 8. And then that has pushed people into a more visible position closer to Manchester and to the library. Uh, but we're now trying to find resources to get all those people indoors as well. There's a great volunteer group called Grassroots Neighbors, which has, they're out there almost every day, but uh, they're doing casework with people with PATH and with SHARE, which is a, a, a housing solution I like. It's people actually sharing a house together, roommates. Um, you know, maybe six or eight of them in a house in a sort of a mutually supportive, almost 12 step environment. Cher has been out there. Somebody, a guy named Miguel just got uh, housed uh, this week. So if, if the motion I did with Mark and Karen, the, the housing now thing gets approved, we can do what we did in Venice a lot faster and a lot more comprehensively in Westchester Park, uh, in other parts of my district and other parts of the city. Uh, but that's what we're trying to do uh, in Westchester now. It's step by step as opposed to one big thing all at once. Yes, uh, one of our members was concerned with the crime in the park. There, there has been, uh, uh, according to LAPD, uh, some, some recent crime in the park. Uh, some uh, uh, has been related to the fact that people are living there. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with, uh, at least according to LAPD, uh, there has been some uh, gang rivalry that has been reemerging. Uh, that is less familiar to our gang intervention groups on the west side because it comes from uh, uh, some factions in Inglewood and uh, they, have, they often come to Westchester Park. Uh, there was supposed to be a, a big memorial service last week uh, where there was some concern about stuff happening. Fortunately, it, it, it stayed peaceful. But it, for, for me, that underscores the need to be reimagining public safety and investing more in groups like the Helper Foundation and, and gang intervention services and we're slowly starting to do that. That's a whole other conversation. Wow. Let's go back to um, Sheriff Alex Villanueva. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what we'll be saying soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's going on with the sheriff and you? Oh, man. Um, you know, Venice is, as I said, it's a place where there's a spotlight. So people will come there. Uh, and people will use the spotlight of Venice Beach to draw attention to themselves. And, um, you know, the, the, the sheriff is now on this media push where he's taking credit for, 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 for Venice Beach. Um, sheriff, the only beds he has to offer are in a jail cell. So we didn't use any housing resources he had to offer. Uh, yeah. We started working on this with St. Joseph's Center back in March and April. And I put in a, a funding request for it in council in May. Three days later, the sheriff showed up, sent his units out in Venice. He yeah. says he, he, he says he forced me to do it. He showed up as soon as he got wind that something was about mm -hmm. to happen in Venice. And he came down uh, with his Klieg lights and his cameras and all that. And they made a big deal out of the fact that they brought somebody to the VA, a veteran who was disabled who'd been on the beach. Well, turns out a very good reporter, Kate Cagle from Spectrum, uh, okay. uh, did a follow-up and found out he was back on the beach because he spent the night in his wheelchair outside the VA. Um, you know, St. Joseph Center actually brought people 
to places uh, and and is is doing a good job keeping them uh, indoors. So uh, the sheriff came down for a few more PR appearances and you know talked tough, threatened he was going to clear everybody out by July fourth. Uh, uh, talked about saying you're not welcome here, go back to where you came from. Really very harsh Trump-like rhetoric and 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 tactics. And, you know, uh, we tried to explain to a lot of folks just who this character was. Folks on the West Side, not very familiar with Villanueva. Uh, not a lot of folks on the West Side have Googled LASD gangs. Not a lot of folks on the West Side are aware of just the, the horrible track record that, that this guy has of civil rights violations and 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 in the short brutality. time he's been in the in office, short time he's been there right the very short time yep. he's been in office uh and you know there's some people who believe his narrative that he's the one who did it ain't true but you know there's different narrative machines in los angeles and then Thank there's you. some people who yeah you know, there are some people who actually support his approach because you know the 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 the, the, the heavy hammer of the law is what they want. And, um, you know, he's trying to, I think he's trying to curry favor with people who uh, ordinarily would vote progressive by capitalizing on frustration with the homelessness crisis. And, and to flex from his own problems that exactly. he has. Yep. Because he's getting a lot of criticism in another part of town. Yep. So he's gone. It's a great political strategy as a strategist. I got to say, it's a very good strategy, Alex, but we see right through you. Yep. It's a it's a very good strategy. And you know what? People are going to be making the homelessness crisis an issue a lot between now and the 2022 elections, particularly in the mayor's race. Good. But make them make them real damn solutions and and things that work. Uh, We don't need more press conferences. We don't need more photo ops. We need to get people indoors. I'm so happy you mentioned the mayor's race. What are you looking for in the next mayor? Karen what, Bass. What, what kind of leader? You know what? <laughs> we like you. We really Karen Bass. Like you. We like you even more. Yes, we are definitely Karen I, Bass supporters. I, I am. Here. I am a big fan of Karen Bass. I um, I have known Karen Bass since when she was running for assembly assembly That's I first met her yes uh and i've been a big fan ever since she was one of my first endorsements in 2013 and uh she and unite here were among my first two and they both meant a lot to me in 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 my heart because i just have such enormous respect for her and you know she she's uh been a long time friend she is my congresswoman you know in mar vista i'm represented by karen and She's phenomenal. And yeah. I've been, she gets at least a weekly text from me encouraging her to run. And my message to her has been, I love you and I want you to be my mayor and I love yes. you and I would not wish the job upon you, but <laughs> please do it. <laughs> so hopefully yeah, in the I, next couple of weeks, she'll get in. I'm, I'm hoping she will too. As you know, I've written about it. I've talked about it. We haven't elected a black woman in the city of LA since 2001 mm-hmm. <laughs> with Jam Perry. Yep. So it would be interesting 20 years later to see, um, you know, that happen. But yeah, I'm happy you brought up, you know, you give me such great segues tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike, for making this easy. Unite here. <laughs> Today, Unite here held a press conference on the steps of City Hall to yep. talk about the lack of enforcement around um str short short ugh. let me not use acronyms here but doesn't know what short-term we're talking rentals. about short-term rentals and they talked a lot about the um home sharing ordinance yep. um as well as this vacation um home situation which yep. i know came up when i was working for herb and account yep. i think believe when i was working for her yep. so Let's talk about that for a minute, because that also yeah. has a role in our house. So when I did our introduction, I said our unhoused crisis and our housing crisis, right? Because I do believe that we have a housing crisis too. The cost of living in this city is too damn high. It's yep. just absolutely ridiculous. It is. And the salaries do not match. Nope. The salaries just do not match. And it, for, for people like me and younger people, home owning is almost like, not here in LA. Yep. <laughs> like if we do, if we do buy a house, we will never be able to afford a house here. It's like yep. a gonna. It's like a dream that's gone mm-hmm. now, right? Yep. So 
but this issue around the enforcement of of um, short term rentals and Airbnbs is a huge issue in our city. And yes, you know, Unite Here has been talking about this for quite some time. And um, I just kind of wanted to know, I mean, I know this is something that uh, has come before you that yeah. you have to obviously deal with. What are your thoughts around it? So l- l- let me break it down for folks who aren't familiar, because in my district, this is an epic, epic problem. Uh, oh, that's I why that. I was yeah. I, I was Herb's co-sponsor of of the motion that started the original home sharing ordinance, which took like three or four years to get that through. It was a great coalition of neighborhood groups, Unite Here, the hotels. How often do you get Unite Here and the hotels on, on the same side? Uh, coalition for Economic Survival, renters. It wasn't a big problem citywide. It was a, a problem in some areas. It was a problem in Hollywood. It was a phenomenon, but not as much of a problem in downtown where the neighborhood identity was still shaping. In Venice and other coastal communities, but particularly Venice, it was a crisis where, you know, a whole block would be lost to short-term rentals. Uh, and, and neighborhoods uh, uh, really lost uh, rental stock. And a lot of it was, was, was RSO units. Uh, and it was a real disaster. So I, I, I pushed hard for this and we got it in. And, um, you know, we, we tried to make the ordinance as simple as possible to apply for. And um, because the, the thing that the city is horrible at is enforcing anything, frankly. I was just about to say that. <laughs> we don't enforce our illegal cannabis. No, uh, it, it, I mean, there's, the I city does on a, on. Yeah. a lousy job enforcing stuff. And I was very concerned about this. So the idea was make it simple uh, so that you could, you, you could do a lot of verification of a legal or an illegal unit uh, by, fa- by, by, by checking whether or not a registration number was, was, was valid, something that could be done through, through software. And Herb was, was very big on, on that. Um, uh, but the enforcement hasn't been happening. Nithya Raman and I just put in a motion a couple of weeks ago to uh, try to push for tougher enforcement. Uh, so I support, I mean, I support Unite Here and I support the press conference they did today. Here's the scary thing. Uh, there is this vacation rental ordinance coming in, yeah, which is, it's the equivalent of, uh, depending on how old you are, if you're my age or older, pouring a bottle of white out over the, the short-term rental ordinance, or just taking the delete key and, and, and pressing it until it's erased. And I'll, and I'll explain why. The, 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 the balance that we struck on the short-term rental ordinance was to allow people to do it in their primary residence, right? right? That's been a hard thing for the city to enforce. City still ain't enforcing that well. When you come in and you say, well, we'll let people do it in their second home. Well, you've just, you've just made it impossible to enforce. It really is just a way of tearing up the ordinance. Uh, so I am very strongly opposed to to the vacation rental thing, and I hope we can get enough votes together to stop it from from going through. You know, I I'm conflicted with that one too because you know, look, I got friends around that horseshoe, and some of these um, ordinances folks are authoring have left me confused as to whether or not they care about the housing crisis. So I have to make a couple phone calls to some people so I can get a greater understanding on why we would want, I think the number we that, that's been going around is uh, 14,000 um, units are going to be off, off the market. Yep. I mean, um, it's, if, it's... if this goes through and we, this housing is such a, such a crisis and we cannot be adding to the problem in that kind of a way. It, you know? it, it's a crisis in so many ways. I mean, th- there are so many ways that we need to, to act to address it. And I don't know why we would just, uh, you know, put another hole in the bottom yeah. of the boat. Um, yeah, I, I agree. We make it such good time. Okay, now we get to get into the fun question. So, this week, y'all decided to have the city attorney draft up a ordinance that looks at banning protests at 
elected officials home. So let me preface my comments with this. I have mixed feelings about it, Mike, because when I ran for County Central Committee, mm -hmm. it did not dawn on me when I got listed on that ballot and won that my home address was going to become public. Mm -hmm. And yep. so it became public. I don't like it, but it is what it is, right? But at the same time, look, I don't believe in going from A to Z. I don't, like, I'll use you an example. If I call you and I'm mad about something and I want to have a meeting, I want to, you know, my group wants to meet with you and you agree to have the meeting, I should not be showing up at your house. Yep. But if you do like Jackie Lacey and spend five to six years hiding from people, well, then what other choice do people have but to show up at your house yeah. if, they, if they can't meet with you? So I have these mixed feelings. I was talking to a good friend of mine who's also on the board of Law Pack who said, you know, people's homes should be sacred. You know, some people are taking care of their grandmas and, you know, their parents and, you know, who ain't got nothing to do with this and don't yeah. want to be bothered with people protesting at their house. And I get that too. But then the other part of me says, look, you know what we say about, police officers sometimes when things happen, well, you signed up for the job. You knew what you was getting into. I sometimes feel that about us. We signed up for the job. Yep. If you run for office, the, it, everybody's not going to be singing in the choir and patting you on the back all the time. Yep. If they are, something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I just, I'm, I have mixed feelings. And so I don't know. I kind of feel like this is a little self-serving. And I also kind of feel like we already got laws that deal with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I have, I have mixed feelings as well. You know, I've had uh, protests at my house. Um, uh, Don't say. They came and, to your house. Uh, they have. Uh, and mine have been primarily right wing. Um, they were uh, chanting White Lives Matter. They were chanting evict the homeless from Los Angeles. I, I had them about five or six times last year. Uh, and I did sign up for it, you know. Uh, I volunteered for this job, you know, I, I worked hard for this job uh, and I knew what I signed up for. My seven year old, my seven year old didn't. Right. Nuri's daughter didn't. Paul Krikorian's two kids didn't. Bob Blumenfield's two kids didn't. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I voted to ask the city attorney to draft the ordinance, although I'm, I'm pretty sure I will be voting against it. Um, I wanted to see the ordinance because the way it was proposed, it was um, banning from a certain distance from a targeted individual's home. And what I've been noticing on the internet is um, that there are some people who have been identifying uh, uh, Proud Boys, have been identifying some of the, these alt-right characters uh, who are then getting harassed at their homes. And I wanted to see if there's a way that, that, that there's some protection for folks like that. But in the end, you know, I, I kind of agree with what Nithya said at the end of the conversation is that we already have a hundred yards. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a pretty good distance, right? That's, that's, that, that, that is, you know, uh, a, a, a pretty big distance. And uh, that doesn't get particularly well enforced. But also importantly, and, and this is where I, I think is what's going to guide me when, whenever this comes back and, and lead me to vote against it, is I don't think it's the protesting that's the problem, right? When, 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 when a colleague's home gets vandalized, that's vandalism. When, 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 when a guy, as what happened last Sunday that precipitated this, a guy held a rally in Santa Monica and- I was there. And, and, I, and I showed there. our addresses and said- we need a civil yeah. war, go to their homes, get your guns. Well, my thing is, why the hell hasn't that guy been arrested for inciting violence? I you know, agree. It's not the protest. I'm more afraid of the person who comes at three in the morning by himself than I am with, you know, 20 people outside yelling at me. I so. agree with you. I, I accidentally stumbled into that protest in Oof. Santa Monica because I went to go eat dinner in Santa Monica and got out the car and it was um, a whole bunch of people with Trump flags and other things. And I got scared. I was like, oh my God, what's going on in the parking yep. lot? And as soon as I stepped out of the parking lot, it was all these people, yep. oh my God, what is going on? In Santa Monica of all places. Yep. I said, I, 
they know where to do this at because they well, wouldn't be doing this in cer- other certain parts of the neighborhood. <laughs> they, but yeah. um, but yeah, that that they and and they are. I gotta tell you, people can say whatever they want about Black Lives Matter, particularly our LA chapter. But mm-hmm. the LA chapter does not vandalize people's cars. Nope. They don't show up at people's houses, nope. busting out windows. Nope. They don't terrorize people's kids and people's family members. They don't do that. But that group did do that they, they did oh. and 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 that's that's part of the thing you know you know why isn't this guy who incited the violence getting charged with something and what i've seen more of is in these demonstrations these clashes between protesters and counter protesters you know some reporters are getting roughed up some counter protesters are getting roughed up uh, some bystanders have gotten roughed up and nothing seems to to happen in those cases and that's what we should be focusing on not the free expression part. Well, Ms. Joy Atkinson has a question. Joy, Ms. Joy Atkinson, she's a member of the Law Pack Board and she's also a commissioner with the Board of Neighborhood, Board of Neighborhood Commissioners. Commissioners. Yes, she is. So she says, what is happening to those reported unused funds for renters and small landlords since there is no longer a rent moratorium has dispersing the funds Ooh. been made, I think she means been made easier. Um, Yes, but let me let me let me step back because there's a difference between um, there's a difference between different jurisdictions. So on the, the moratorium, the Supreme Court rejected the CDC's national moratorium, but right. the ordinance that the LA City Council passed in March 2020 that, that I co-authored is still in place and will be in place for one year after the end of the state of emergency. So. LA renters are still protected. Their landlord can send them an eviction notice, but if they're having trouble paying because of COVID, uh, any connection to COVID, uh, then they cannot be evicted. They have that defense against eviction. Um, The the renter relief program uh, has been uh, not well done nationwide. I mean, it's been a problem nationwide. The money came through the state and the city opted to take its chunk of money and Mm -hmm. was trying to target it for particularly low income families. And uh, they were doing it in chunks and it was happening too slowly and people weren't allowed to apply for for months. So uh, just last week, we voted to uh, go back to doing it through the state which is faster and which actually gets us more money for Los Angeles because we have such need. So as of uh, yesterday, uh, people in Los Angeles, either renters or landlords are allowed to apply for the rent and utility relief from the state. Um, And they can apply through the website housingiskey.com. And anybody, it's housingiskey.com, anybody who has any questions about eviction protections, renters' rights, um, the city and the county have a website, stayhousedla.org. Let's stayhousedla.org. And that breaks down what your protections are in the city, county, and and the state. And those are two really great resources. Thank you for that question. Awesome. We had this question emailed in. Um, Saban serves approximately 20,000 patients a year, about 10% of whom are people experiencing homelessness. 41.8% could disconnect people experiencing homelessness from the healthcare system. Oh, I'm sorry, 41.18, the ordinance, could disconnect people experiencing homelessness from the healthcare service that they are currently receiving and make it difficult to re-engage this population if individuals become displaced. However, the proposed street engagement strategy would assist in preventing the disruption of daily care health centers provide to people experiencing homelessness through street medicine and other safety net programs. Can you elaborate on what you and other council members are willing to do to assist the bond and other healthcare centers stay connected to the homeless they serve? Uh, Thank you for the question. That's a, a, a complicated question, and I'm not particularly good at giving short answers on homelessness, but I'll do my best. Um, the ordinance she talked about, 4118, is an ordinance that um, uh, Joe Buscaino, uh, my colleague from San Pedro who's running for mayor, 
uh, tried to Who bring shall back. Who never be mayor? Who shall never ever? Karen be Bass mayor. Uh, tried to bring back, and he, he tried to pull it out of Mark's uh, Mark Ridley Thomas's committee. And what it would do is it would expand drastically the areas in the city where it is uh, illegal to sit, lie, or sleep. Um, now that kind of ordinance, uh, as Marquise pointed out, uh, tends to be. Uh, enforced in a discriminatory manner as loitering laws uh, are. Um, and um, it is part of that strategy I talked about earlier in, in the call about uh, legislating and, and trying to criminalize homelessness and trying to pass laws to make it go away. It pushes people around, it disconnects them with services, it disconnects them from, from, from the clinic and other services. Um, MRT is uh, uh, trying to limit it and soften it through um, a, a, a street engagement strategy, which would require lots of outreach. In my mind, there's no point in outreach unless there's housing to be offered when you do the outreach. So that's going through the process now. Uh, it was actually in Mark's committee last week. It was in a different committee this week, probably be before council in a couple of weeks, but we, we, we got to make real the, the the connection to housing and what scares me about the what what the council has proposed is you know joe wants to say um if you're offered a shelter bed and don't take it uh then uh we can enforce this ordinance and you know what i don't trust the city i don't trust government not to offer the lowest common denominator thing to get away with criminalization. A, a, right now, I don't want people going into congregate shelters that, that spread COVID. Right now, I do not want a, 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 a woman who's a survivor of domestic violence uh, to be going into a big co-ed dorm. You know, I don't want uh, somebody who is a, 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 a youth, a teenage runaway, going into a general population. You need to make sure you are getting people the housing and the services they need. People aren't service resistant. They're, we, we, are, we offer bad resources and then get mad at people for not accepting them. We blame them for accepting something that may be worse than, than, than the current situation. So um, we are kind of at a turning point in a, a, a decision point about how we're gonna address homelessness. Are we going to go the criminalization way, which doesn't work and is expensive, or we're going to go the housing and services way, which works if, if, if you do it right? Well, we're almost out of time, and I wanted to see if you had anything um, you would like to leave us with before we get out of here. Um, yes, actually, it, it, it's, it's an ask. I, mean, I, I really appreciate uh, 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 the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, one of the things that, that I think is, is true, and, and Jasmine can probably a, a, attest to this, is at City Hall, people's staffs tend to look like them um, or look like the districts they represent. And um, I have strived over the years to diversify my staff, and sometimes it's been more diverse than at other times. Um, uh, I would love to be able to get uh, the assistance of your networks and your connections uh, in hiring, uh, particularly black women, um, uh, men or women, but I, I want to be able to expand the network so that my, my staff looks even more diverse than, than my district. And um, I actually have a couple openings we're trying to fill now for a legislative person and a field person. And I'd, I'd love to send over the job description. Email them to me, send I will. them to me and I'll get them out to the network. And yes, he's really good about that. Because remember you had that social media position and you emailed me and asked me yep. if I knew anyone. So yes, I can yep. attest, definitely can attest to that. You still remain one of my favorite council members in the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> thank <Mike>. you. <laughs> um, I thank you so much for taking the time to come speak with us this evening. Um, I also want to thank Elena and Martha and your office for making it happen because as a staffer for many years, I never overlooked the people behind the elected official because we work oh so hard to make y'all look oh so good. They are <laughs> awesome. Oh, and I, I, I should say, I should say, while I'm here doing the commercial, um, uh, uh, this isn't an endorsement interview, but I am up for re-election, MikeBonin.com. Uh, I'm also facing a recall and that's a whole other story, but um, 
Uh, put you my name to... on your endorsement list. Thank please. you very much. Okay, please do <laughs> Thanks, that. everybody. We'll talk offline. Okay. Um, if you're planning to run for office, want to learn the issues, meet the candidates, get more involved in your community, Law Pack is going to be holding their monthly virtual meet and greet for new, current, and new, current, and prospective members next Tuesday, September 7th at 5 p.m. To sign up, go to lawpack.org. Again, my name is Jasmine Canick, and it's been my absolute pleasure to spend this hour with you discussing the issues that matter to us most. Thank you again, Councilmember Mike Bonin. And on behalf of the Executive Board of Law Pack, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Hold on, let me. Okay. And me.